You are listening to the Adult Sabbath School Lessons for the third quarter of 2022. This is lesson number eight of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in the Crucible with Christ. The lesson is titled Seeing the Invisible and is ready for teaching on August 20. The author is Pastor Gavin Anthony, who was conference president in Iceland when he wrote this series of lessons. Today, your lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 13. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the indestructible Jesus is the one who gives us an indestructible hope. And as we look at our lesson this week, as we search your word, we pray that we will not be disappointed, but that our hope will be not in vain, but a hope that is going to give us guidance and blessing because it's based in you. And as we look forward to the day when Jesus comes, we just thank you that we can help share your word with others and that we can also share your love with them as well, that they may want to know you also. And now I pray for those who are listening to this podcast, Lord, wherever they happen to be. And as we listen, I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us, bless us, and bless our individual families. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, you may find it interesting that in the last three months, the YouTube version of this podcast has received comments from people in a whole range of countries. I'm just going to read them out to you. There's people who've contacted us from Jamaica and Kenya and the United Kingdom and Wilson in um, North Carolina and Guyana and Canada and St. Lucia and Athens and Lusaka in Zambia and St. Vincent's in the Grenadines and Morelos in Mexico and West Indies in the Philippines and Kenya and Barbados and Alabama and Antigua and Barbada. Uh, um, Dominican Republic, New Zealand, San Francisco in California, the Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic, probably our most faithful contact, Australia, Trinidad and Tobago, Thailand, Costa Rica, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates. And if you would like to contact me to just let me know where you were listening, I'd love to just know where you are. Uh, Some have just put their flags there and that causes me to have to go looking at a list of flags. But if you just put the country you're listening in or even the town, uh, I would love to hear from you. Well, let's get on with our lesson. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Let's read that again, Hebrews 11, 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The definition of faith in the book of Hebrews is always challenging. Verse 1 read in chapter 11, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. How can we be sure about what we do not see? Yet, this is exactly what Moses illustrates in our memory verse. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible, Hebrews 11.27. It is even more challenging to realise that we are called to see him who is invisible, not simply when times are good, but especially when everything is going wrong. For this we need faith, a Christ-like faith that must be shaped by the truth about God and God's kingdom. The truth about our Father's goodness, the power of the name of Jesus, the power of the resurrection and the compassion of God are essential truths that will enable us to stand strong when we are in the crucible and may be tempted to doubt everything. And the weak at a glance... What truths about God can help sustain us through even the worst situations? (music) 
Sunday, August 14, Our Father's Extravagance If God really loved me, he would certainly do blank for me. I wonder how many times that thought has flickered through our minds. We look at our circumstances and then begin to wonder whether God really loves us, because if he really did, things would be different. There are two rationales that often lead us to doubt God's goodness. First, when we have a burning desire in our hearts and minds for something that we believe is good, the idea that God might want something different for us may seem ridiculous. Second, we may doubt God's goodness because our experience clashes with what we believe. If something looks good or feels good or sounds good or tastes good, then it must be good. And so we get angry with God when we can't have it. This is where faith comes into play. Faith comes into action precisely at those times we are tempted to doubt God and his goodness. Romans 8 verses 28 to 39 is a powerful passage that describes the goodness of God toward us. What reasons can you find in the text that can guard our minds against doubting God's goodness? Romans 8, beginning at verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, those he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 8.32, which read, He who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? There is an important piece of logic that is extremely helpful in guarding us from becoming overwhelmed by our circumstances. As it says in the message, if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own Son, Is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? How could we possibly think that God would send Jesus to die for us and then turn mean and stingy? This means that the truth of God's generosity to us, seen in the death of Christ, must have a stronger impact in our thinking than all the doubts that the crucible may generate inside us. And so to finish the day, How is it possible for a truth, God's goodness, to have a more powerful effect on you than your doubts? Spend some time meditating on the truth that God has given Jesus to die in your place, and that this incredible generosity continues in a thousand different ways for you today. What does this do for your faith?
Monday, August 15, in the name of Jesus. John 14, verse 14 reads, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus was not going to be with the disciples much longer. The one who had been their support and encouragement was going to heaven, and the disciples were beginning to feel confused and powerless. But, though the disciples would not be able to see him physically any longer, Jesus gave them a remarkable promise. Read John 14, verses 1 to 14. According to verses 13 and 14, Jesus promises to do for us anything that we ask in his name. Because of this, we almost always add on at the end of our prayers, In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's read John 14, 1 to 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When we say this, in Jesus' name, Amen, what do we normally think it means? What does Jesus mean when he encourages us to pray like this? What clues are there in these verses that help us to understand the point he's making? When our request is, in the name of Jesus, we can be certain that the whole machinery of heaven is at work on our behalf. We may not see the angels working all around us, but they are, sent from the throne of heaven in the name of Jesus to fulfil our requests. Sometimes, when we pray in the name of Jesus, we open our eyes and expect everything to be different around us, but it all looks the same. However, while the power of God may come with dramatic effect as when Jesus calmed the storm, it also may come in quietness, unnoticed, as when the power of God sustained Jesus in Gethsemane. Something dramatic may not suddenly happen, but that doesn't mean that God is not at work for us. And so to finish the day, read John 14, 1 to 14 again. As you read, imagine that Jesus is talking directly to you, face to face. What hope and encouragement can you draw from these promises? At the same time, ask yourself, what things in my life could be standing in the way of having these promises fulfilled for me? What changes must I purpose in my heart to make? Let's begin John chapter 14 at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, 
I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes me... The works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Tuesday, August 16. The Power of the Resurrection The Resurrection addresses the problem of human powerlessness. When we think about the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, we often think about how the death of Jesus was the event that made us legally right with God, and that of course is true. However, the resurrection adds a specific dimension to salvation. The resurrection of Jesus is meaningful not just because it shows us that one day we will be resurrected as well. The resurrection placed Jesus at the right hand of the Father in a position of power and authority. This resurrection power is the same power that God makes available for us today. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, Paul talks about the power of God. What does this text teach us about the power of the resurrection? What hope and promises for yourself can you find in these verses? Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, "...the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ." when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all, in all. Paul is praying that the Ephesians understand a few things that can be understood properly only with divine help. One, that there is the hope of transformation and an eternal future to which Jesus has called us, and two, that we understand the power that was manifested in our behalf. Paul then tries to describe how astonishing this power is. The power that is available to us today is the same power that resurrected Jesus not just out of the ground and back to life, but to the place of power at the Father's right hand. But Paul doesn't stop there. The resurrection didn't simply give Jesus just any sort of power. It gave him the power to rule and provide every possible thing his people could ever need for all eternity. And so to finish the day, Make a list of the areas in your life where you need the power of the resurrected Jesus. When you have finished, pray that this power will be applied to all these areas of need. At the same time, what can you do better? What choices can you make that can allow this power to work more freely in your life?
Wednesday, August 17, to carry all our worry. There is a plaque that some people have in their homes that reads, Why pray when you can worry? It makes us laugh because we know how often we worry rather than come to God and give Him our concerns. Someone once said that when our life becomes all tied up, we should give it to God and let Him untie the knots. How God must long to do this for us. Yet, amazingly, we manage to hang on to our problems until we are about to snap. Why do we wait until we are desperate before we go to the Lord? Read First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Peter is quoting from Psalm 55, 22. What's the basic message here for us? And we'll also look at Matthew 6, 25 to 33. But first of all, First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And then Psalm 55 verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. And Matthew 6, beginning at verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It is a very simple text. There is no secret hidden in it, and it means exactly what it says. To cast means to do just that, to throw, to give away, so that what is causing the aching and the concern no longer has any connection to you. But of course, our burdens are not thrown just anywhere. Our worry does not disappear into a void, it is given to our Father in heaven who promises to sort it out. That's what Jesus is telling us in the verses in Matthew. The problem in doing this is not that it's hard, rather it's just that it seems too easy, too good to be true. Anxiety is caused by all sorts of things. It could be due to pressure from work, unexpected criticism, feeling that we are unwanted or unloved, health or financial worries, feeling that we are not good enough for God or believing that we are not forgiven. Whatever the reasons are, one reason we hang on to our problems is that we think we can sort them out better than anyone else can. But Peter urges us to reconsider any such idea. The reason we don't have to worry is that God cares. But does God still care enough to intervene when a divorce is looming or we feel totally useless? The Bible says that He cares enough to transform any situation. And so to finish the day, what are things that cause you worry now? However legitimate they are, however troublesome they are, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Maybe our biggest problem is that even though we believe that God knows about it and can fix it, we don't believe that He will resolve it in the way we would like it resolved. Dwell on that last point and ask yourself how true it is in your own life.
Thursday, August 18. Still faithful when God cannot be seen. To think that no one cares about what is happening to us is very unpleasant. But to think that God does not know or care about us can be most distressing. To the Judeans, exiled in Babylon, God did not seem to care much about their situation. They were still exiled, still feeling abandoned by God because of their sin. But Isaiah speaks words of comfort to them. Isaiah 40 is a beautiful passage in which Isaiah speaks so tenderly to the people about their God. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Isaiah 40 verse 11. But after so long, the exiles were thinking, Where are you, O Lord? We can't see any evidence that you were still there or care. Read Isaiah 40, verses 27 to 31. In what ways does Isaiah describe God? How is this description of God meant to answer their belief that my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Isaiah 40, verse 27. Let's read, beginning at Isaiah, verse 27 of chapter 40. Why do you say, O Lord, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Another group of people who might have considered that their way was hidden from God is found in the book of Esther. In this book, God is not mentioned even once. However, the whole story is an unfolding drama of God's intervention to save his people from an irrevocable law to have them destroyed. Not only does this story describe events of the past, but it also symbolises a time in the future when God's people will again be persecuted and a law again will be introduced for their destruction, as we read in Revelation 13.15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Can you imagine how easy it would be to conclude that if such terrible circumstances existed, God must surely have deserted his people? But we are not to fear. The same God who saved his chosen ones in the story of Esther will save them again in the final crisis. And so to finish the day, we have read how Isaiah described God to the exiles How would you describe God to people who felt that God had disappeared and had abandoned them? How would you teach them to see through the eyes of faith and not be dependent on what they see around them with their human eyes? Friday, August 19. From Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, page 225, Ellen G. White writes, Has not God said he would give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And is not this Spirit a real, true, actual guide? Some men seem afraid to take God at his word, as though it would be presumption in them. They pray for the Lord to teach us, and yet are afraid to credit the pledged word of God and believe we have been taught of him. So long as we come to our Heavenly Father humbly and with a spirit to be taught, willing and anxious to learn, why should we doubt God's fulfilment of his own promise? You must not for a moment doubt him and dishonour him thereby. 
When you have sought to know his will, your part in the operation with God is to believe that you will be led and guided and blessed in the doing of his will. We may mistrust ourselves, lest we misinterpret his teachings, but make even this a subject of prayer and trust him. Still, trust him to the uttermost, that his Holy Spirit will lead you to interpret aright his plans and the working of his promises. And from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 555, Faith grows strong by coming in conflict with doubts and opposing influences. The experience gained in these trials is of more value than the most costly jewels. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, as a class, talk about the kind of things we believe in that we do not see, things that we know are real yet are beyond our sight. How can this help us understand what it means to see Him who is invisible? Two, discuss the final question found at the end of Wednesday's study. How often do we find ourselves in that situation? What can we do that will better enable us to trust that the Lord's way is the best, even if it's not what we want? Three, if faith grows strong by coming in conflict with doubts and opposing influences, and this leads to something extremely valuable, of more value than the most costly jewels, how should this shape the way we look at such conflicts? And four, most of us have seen people, even fellow Christians, in situations in which, at least from our perspective, the outcome was horrible. The worst thing we imagined happened, despite the prayers and best efforts. How do we understand this in light of what we have been studying? Inside Story And here's part 8 of our serialised mission story for this quarter, read by Sibella. Married to Christ, part 8 by Andrew McChesney. A week after giving his heart to Jesus, Father started to clear out the temple in Manaus, Brazil. He gathered the images and the stone altars where he had sacrificed animals and bowed to evil spirits. At the spirit's request, Father shipped the temple paraphernalia to two women in another town. He finished the task on a Friday. As he got into his car, evil spirits growled that they were going to kill him. Suddenly, a dark shadow shaped like a man and comprised of three spirits entered the car. The spirits showed Father a distant light. Out of the light loomed a cross filled with mud. The spirits sneered that it was the end for Father. As a dead man, can I make a last statement? Father asked. Without waiting for a reply, he said, Jesus, please sit beside me in the car and take me home. The dark shadow vanished. It was the first time the father had called on Jesus and he felt protected. The next morning, father attended Sabbath worship services for the first time. It was a communion Sabbath and he sensed a supernatural energy similar to what he had experienced at Junior's baptism. As someone washed his feet, Father's sins passed before his eyes. Tears flowed as he asked God for his forgiveness. He felt as though the Holy Spirit was washing him clean. A short time later, Father proposed to Mother, and they officially got married. Mother was especially happy. Now she could be baptised. The day before her baptism, Father and Junior went to the Alpha Seventh-day Adventist Community Church to listen as Mother rehearsed with a choir. A ladder which was being used to decorate the church suddenly toppled over, and the man standing on it slammed into Father, knocking him to the floor. Father offered assurances that he was fine, but a moment later began to shriek. Two evil spirits had possessed him. Junior ran to Father. He lay on the ground, his body quivering. A spirit snarled through his mouth that he had wanted to kill Father with the ladder. Junior had heard about the great controversy between Christ and Satan, but he had never witnessed it in real life. He prayed. 
The choir spontaneously sang, Jesus Christ, you are the bridegroom, the sower, my father and my shepherd, the pearl of great price. Christ, you are everything. Mother grabbed father's twisted hands and tried to straighten them. They felt terribly cold. A spirit spewed hatred at her. Then father spoke in a small and distant voice. It hurts, he said. About an hour of praying and singing, father returned to normal. Although in pain, father joined Junior at church for mother's baptism on Sabbath morning. With joy, mother sank into the water. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.